Church, turn your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 3 as we're studying the, the book of Genesis here. Chapter 3, we're, we're partway through chapter 3, we're going to finish it tonight, and then we're going to go into a part of chapter 4 also. You know, last, last study we had in chapter 3, we've seen three different curses pronounced by God, I want to say, put there by God, those three different curses that took place in chapter 3. Now, the first one was to the serpent. Now, it says the serpent. Now, we know the serpent is Satan. Many biblical uh, uh, scriptures speak of the serpent and the Satan. And the first was Satan, right? And God put that curse upon him. you going down to the ground. You're going to go and slither on your belly from now on, and you're going to eat dust. You see, the serpent was a beautiful animal before that. The serpent stood upright. The serpent looked like, well, he spoke to Eve. He was very charming. Now he's just a slithering snake. He had that curse put upon him, and also the curse of enmity. Enmity forever with mankind. Hatred. Hatred of Satan towards mankind and hatred of mankind towards Satan. Part of that curse. And then, of course, part of that curse is the ultimate death and penalty of Satan. Still to come, by the way. But it is prophesied right here in Genesis 3. He says, you will be crushed. He'll crush you with his heel. In 15, verse 15 last week, we read there, And I will put enmity, speaking to Satan, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head. Who? He? Jesus. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, because you're just a slithering snake. You can't get no higher than the heel, right? I mean, that's the way I look at it. Prophecy of a coming Messiah and prophecy of a coming judgment. Right there in the beginning of God's word in Genesis. Jesus coming from the seed of a woman, right? Not the seed of a man. Not from the seed of man. Obviously, Jesus was a virgin birth. Immaculate conception. So, but from the seed of the woman, and that's what God tells uh, Satan right off the beginning. Now, the second curse was against the woman. And he spoke about multiplied sorrows. And I spoke about that last time in the fact that these multiplied sorrows, because many people thought all it only has to do with the pain in childbirth. No, the multiplied sorrows of the woman and what she would bear through history, basically. See, back in the time uh, of here, um, you know, in the Old Testament, a woman wasn't held any higher than a cow. She was put down. They traded women like, you know, they would trade anything else. This sorrow, multiplied sorrows, was part of that curse. And, of course, the pain in childbirth also. And then a desire, he said. You'll have a desire to rule. You'll have a desire to rule your husband and, or to rule man even. And, but you're going to be put down. You're going to be put down. The woman would be subject to the husband. Now, ladies, that's not a bad thing. That is not a bad thing in a marriage. In God's order of a marriage, it is a wonderful thing. It is, it is God's design. The man loves his wife as Christ loves the church. <laughs> I, I someday wish I could even add up to that. I try my best. And then the woman follows the man. It's God's design. And then the third curse was Adam, the man, right? Work. You're going to work. You're going to toil. Your life is going to be hard, period, right? Boy, it still is today. How many of us have worked so hard? See, both Adam and the woman, they were given, and I mentioned this last time, they were given opportunity to repent. This is very interesting. Right off the beginning, they were given opportunity to repent, but they both, what they did instead, was both blame shifted one, you know, to another. The man to the woman, well, God, it's, it's this woman you gave me, right? That was this woman you gave me that there's a reason I sinned in the garden, the reason I ate of this fruit. And, of course, the woman said, well, it's that rascally old serpent. It's his fault, blame shifting. Of course, the serpent had no defense at all. God didn't, God didn't even ask him. He just said, you're going to the ground, man. You're down. In verse 12 and 14, we, uh, through 14, we read that. Then the man said, 
He said, uh, then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman now, what, what is this you have done? And the woman said, well, it's, it's the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Blame shifting. Guys, he blame shifted here. Of course, you know, the serpent didn't have any chance to blame shift it anywhere else. But the other two, it never prospers. You know, we need to own what we do. We need to own our sin. Blame shifting never prop, prop, prospers. In Proverbs 28, 13, I love this scripture. It says, he who covers his sins will not prosper. I'm going to cover those sins up. Will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. See, God gave Adam and Eve a chance to repent right there. He said to the man, uh, you know, why did you do this? Well, he starts blaming the woman. And the woman starts blaming Satan. They didn't take that opportunity. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy, you see. That's repentance. Galatians 6, 7. You know, guys, I use this one a lot. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. There you go. We must always remember, our sin is ours ours alone. We can't put it off on somebody else. No matter what we want to say about it, you know, no matter how we want to rephrase it, are we going to rephrase it differently? We need to own it. It's not about what we say. It basically has no bearing on what we say as the truth when it comes to our sin, right? It doesn't matter what we say. It's, it's more, it's not even well, turn your Bibles to John, 1 John chapter uh, 1, if you would. I'm going to read you here in 1 John. And here's another scripture I've used a lot, a lot of times. Because it speaks about well, what we say and what the truth really is. What the crux of the matter is, you know. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. I love this. John writes, if we say that we have fellowship with him... Jesus, with God, and walk in darkness. If we say we have fellowship, but we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. <laughs> Straight to your face. There you go. You're walking in darkness, but you're saying you're having fellowship. I'm sorry, you're lying. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. If we say... If I say that I have no sin, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. All of sin, all of fallen, fall short of the glory of God. If we confess our sins, though. See, this is not what we say. Now it comes to what we confess. That's the important part. That's the important part. 1 John 1, 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because I use that one all the time. <laughs> I got to tell you. Lord, I did it again. You know, I did it again. In verse 10, then it says, if we say that we have not sinned, then we make him, him a liar. Oh, by the way, Jesus, you're, you're this liar. No, not at all. And this word is not in us. See, neither Adam or the woman had the words of John, did they? No, it was long before the Apostle John. Guys, we do. We have John's words. So tonight, tonight, as we continue on, as history continues, this is history from the beginning. Remember that. As history continues, so does sin, by the way. It becomes contagious. What began in Eden, in that beautiful garden, what began there now heads to the outside. The hereditary sin even comes to play. Mankind's sin only grows from this point, from here onward. And, you know, sin just continues to beget and beget sin. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. God, I ask that you bless the reading of your word tonight. You speak to us. Convict our hearts, Lord, and, and teach us where we need to be taught. 
and God correct us and help us to uh, help us, Lord, to God just be ready to repent if there's something in our lives, Lord, to put it before you. Uh, you are so wonderful in Jesus' name, Amen. So the title of my message tonight is "Sin Begat Sin." Oh, it continues on too. It starts here though. Beginning in verse 20 tonight, we head on. Now, it says in verse 20, And Adam called his wife named Eve, because she was the mother of all living, it says there. Adam called her Eve. I want to make a note here. Here is where Eve gains her name. Now, I've said Adam and Eve how many times and how many different teachings prior to this, Right? Well, just natural. We say Adam, we say Eve. Everybody does it, you know. Well, Adam and Eve, but this is actually where she gets her name. She didn't have a name before. Now, well, she was called in the Bible here, uh, you know, female, a helper, comparable, a woman, a wife, but not Eve yet. But now she receives her name. Guys, it can be really easy. And just, this is a small one here, but it can be really easy to read something in that is not there. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why it's good that, by the way, as we read the Word of God, you read the Word of God. Don't believe what I say. Oh, there's those pastors out there. They'll read something in, and if you're not paying attention, I can make it sound like it is the Word of God, and it's not. It's very easy to do that. So Adam named Eve, and Eve took this name that Adam gave her, right? What is that? It's the wife taking the husband's name, you see? Yeah, now, we look at it as a cultural thing today. You know, my wife, before we were married, her last name was Real, and now it's Spencer, right? We think of it as a cultural thing. Actually, it's biblical. There is so much stuff in our culture today, even to the courts and, and to bankruptcy laws and everything else, that actually go back into the Bible, guys. They actually go back there. And so this, he gave her this name, Eve, mother of all living. Now, Eve at this time, she's not a mother at all. Why is he, Adam, naming her the mother of all living? She is not a mother at all. Adam named her in faith. We're going to see that. Adam had faith in what God had said back here in verse 15 of chapter 3. Adam had faith. Faith in God that God was going to provide through Eve that one that would crush Satan, the one that would defeat Satan, the seed of the woman. See, Adam was a very intelligent man. I told you that before. When God brought every animal before him, Adam was probably the smartest man ever to exist. Very, very intelligent. By the way, we have decayed greatly since Adam. Adam had great Mind, and he knew exactly what God was speaking when he said that there. And so by faith, he named her the mother of all living, right? That this was going to take place. In verse 21 now. Now also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God now made tunics of skin and he clothed them. God now wanted Adam and Eve clothed. And he didn't want them clothed in those fig leaves. He did not want them in those leaves. He wanted them clothed, and it would be in animal skins, right? He made tunics of skin, animal skin. Why? That would cost, you see, it would cost the life of something. There would be bloodshed, bloodshed, guys, all the way from the beginning. Has always been atonement for sin, blood shed. And so God covered them with the first, really, sin offering. That blood that covered them. Covered the sin and the sacrificial blood of this animal. In Hebrews 9.22, uh, it says there, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission, the word says, the writer of Hebrews says. Now, Adam and Eve were now clothed. They were covered, I want to tell you. Adam and Eve, at this time, by the faith of Adam and the covering that God had made for them, were saved. Saved through faith. Adam's faith in God 
just as many in the Old Testament. How are they saved? By faith. Actually, how are we saved? By faith. See, nothing's ever changed, right? Oh, we're in a new covenant, but the fact of the matter is, it is by faith that Adam was saved. Adam's faith in God of a promise of a Savior, and God covered him, just as we are saved. We're going to see them in heaven. And when I see Adam, I'm going to kick him in the tail. I'm going to say, dude, you messed it up. Man, you're in Yeah, I'm going to kick him in the Oh, there's going to be a lot of kicking in the tail for that dude. But anyway, in verse 22, let's move on here. Then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Now, guys, this is a difficult scripture to understand right here. Because he says, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Now, I believe this is actually, and I should have grabbed that other scripture in the, or, uh, in the Old Testament. I believe it's more of a sarcasm, a sarcastic speaking that he's got here. Because he says he'd be, the man is never going to be like God, right? He'd already sinned. He'd already fallen. He's going to die, right? He's going to die. But at the same time, uh, he's not going to be like one of them, one of us. You notice the us, though. You see, that's the important part. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The us. God said us. Uh, the Trinity from the beginning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, we like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life. I mentioned that. That was in the garden also. The tree of life. And eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to the till the ground from which he was taken. <laughs> Made a dust, now go till that dust. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life, it says here. So here was, here was Adam, and... He's now been driven out of this area. He's been driven out of Eden. Many believe Adam was banished from the Eden. You might find this interesting, by the way. Many think that he was banished from Eden, and Adam was banished from this garden never to be able to come back. Right? That's what many think. You're never going to be able to come back. No. We're going to see that. You're going to see it as we go through here. No. See, he was sent out. He couldn't live in there anymore. His, his residence would be out there. They'd be farming the land. But he would be able to return to this, you see. What was placed there? Cherubim. Cherubim. A cherubim was placed there and a flaming sword. People say, well, that's to keep Adam out. No, that wasn't to keep Adam out. By the way, we're going to see that's going to keep the Satan out. The cherubim has always been associated in God's word with the presence and glory of God. His holy place, a meeting place that those would come and meet with God, you see. And we're going to see here, these, as we get into chapter 4, yeah, we should get there. With the boys, their boys, they're going to go to that meeting place with their sacrifice before the Lord, you see. This presence, this holy place, a meeting place with God, a tabernacle, right? The Ark of the Covenant. What was on the Ark of the Covenant? Two cherubim. By the way, you couldn't touch the Ark of the Covenant. You can't touch the tree of life, but there's a meeting place there for him. Forbidden to eat that tree from the tree of life, but still come to meet with God. Guys, God will never put himself in a place we can't go meet with him. Do you understand? He's not going to separate himself where we cannot meet with him. Obviously, through Jesus Christ, now we've got direct intercession between us and the, and the Father, between the Son, or through the Son, I should say. But they would be forbidden to eat this tree of life, but they could still come and meet him. God's mercy at the Holy of Holies, basically, this meeting place. Now, it was guarded by a cherubim with a flaming sword and the reason why was to keep Satan out. That Satan could not come and destroy the access to the altar, you see. Satan, that rascally serpent, couldn't get in there. But Adam and Eve, and later on we'll see even others, they're welcome there. They're welcome there. 
Now, this is the last historical mention of the Garden of Eden. This is the last place in the Bible, the historical mention of this garden. What happened? What happened to the Garden of Eden? You might say, well, is it out there? Did God destroy it, maybe, you know? At a certain point, God said, okay, now i got to destroy this. <laughs> no, you know what happened? He let it decay like everything else. He let it decay like everything else. Everything was dying now. That garden was going to crop up weeds too. That garden of Eden was, those trees would die before they wouldn't. Basically, it's just another old decayed spot on the earth. You know, that might still be out there, but we would never recognize it as a garden of Eden because it has decayed so much. The earth was cursed with death. In, four, in chapter 4, verse 1. It says there, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. This here being the first mention of sex in the Bible, sexual relationships. It says he knew her, polite way, polite way of saying well, they had sexual relationships. It's often used in the Bible in that way. So-and-so knew so-and-so, right? It's a beautiful phrase when you think about it. Because, see, it's much more than just the sexual relationship by any means. To know and to, to where it says he knew her. It's an interpersonal relationship between a husband and a wife. It's an interpersonal relationship, knowing one another greatly, deeply, not just the sex of it, but greatly. So he knew her. You know, today the terms that they use are so coarse and violent, and, you know, pornographic even, right? I like that. He knew her. Because that's what it is between a husband and a wife. It's, it's, it's knowing them and an interpersonal relationship. You know, like I say, the stuff today, yeah, it just lacks God's design at all in in what it is to be in a, in a marriage there. You know, in verse 1 there, chapter 4, Eve's first son, now Cain. Cain was born. And she says, I have acquired, I have acquired this man from the Lord. Basically, it says, I got him. I got him. See, Eve thought Cain, much as Adam, she understood too what God said, that this seed was the promised one of chapter 3, verse 15. This would be the deliverer at this time. We've got to get Satan out of the way quickly here. You know, they didn't know, but they thought he'd be the deliverer. And so she says, I've got him, the one, the one. She held the Savior, right? This is what she had, thought she held, but actually she only held a murder. She was holding a murder as a baby. You know, parents always want the best for their kids, don't they? We always want good things for our kids. We want good things for our grandkids, you know. We, wanna, we want them to have the best and, and to grow up. And we try to, you know, well, when we know the Lord, we're raising our kids in the Lord, right? And we want the best, but it doesn't always turn out that way. And, of course, for Eve, we're going to find out it doesn't turn out that way either. In verse 2 then, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain now was a tiller of the ground. One's a farmer, one's a rancher, a sheep herder. Anyway, and in the process of time, process of time, right? Obviously, these two are adults now. They're not little babies out there tilling the ground and running the sheep. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain now brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Probably wheat, all right? Probably grain. And he brought this to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry in his countenance. Fell. So right off the bat here, I want to make a note. We see agriculture. Boom. We're talking, uh, we're talking a mankind of 40, 
Four deep. We got Adam, we got Eve, we got Cain, we got Abel. We see agriculture, we see domestic animals right from the beginning. They're raising the sheep, they're, they're, they're tilling the land. You know, not as the evolutionist wants to say, well, tens of thousands of years later, you know, kind of the thing. You know, they were actually, the, they were living in these caves forever, and they're just these hunters and gatherers, and whatever they could find, you know, I'm going to eat a grub. No, they were right from the beginning. They were tilling land, and they were raising these domestic animals. Man was not some kind of Neanderthal caveman by any mean. Cain was a farmer, and Abel tended sheep, period. History, right there. In verse 3, he said there, he says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought a firstborn of his flock to the fat, uh, and of their fat, by the way, the most desirable part, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, it said. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry. He was angry. And now his countenance fell. He, you know, what's my brother doing over here? You know, how come you're respecting him more so? Now, we can assume on what I said earlier. This offering was before the tree of life. It was in that area where the holies of holies was. There had to be a meeting place with God. We see no area where it said we built a tabernacle or we had an altar built or anything like that. We can assume the meeting place with God was where that cherubim was, right? And so this was before the tree of life. Cain, he brought the grain and Abel brought and slaughtered a sheep, the fat of a sheep, by the way, the firstborn. Okay. Here we go. We got a, we, God created male and female of every animal. Now you got a ram and you got a ewe here. And, well, they probably had some sheep, but let's just say it wasn't. Let's say there's this ram and this ewe, and he brought the firstborn of that one. Wow, what an offering. Your herd's not getting too big yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? His firstborn uh, lamb he brought. The most desired part to the fat. Why God respected Abel more than, uh, more than Cain? Well, there was a bloodshed there. You see, again, a bloodshed. See, there were many offerings, and they, they don't even come to, into play until Moses, until God gives the law to Moses, different offerings to the Lord, and there was a grain offering. But a grain offering was a peace offering. It wasn't a sin-covering offering. It was always blood, as I read in Hebrews there. So this was actually a sin offering that, that uh, Abel was coming before the Lord. It showed Abel's heart also, a heart of sacrificial, wanting that desire to be cleansed, you know, coming before the Lord with a desire, and this blood would cover that. In Hebrews 11.4, now, all of Hebrews 11 is what you could call the hall of faith, okay, the hall of faith. And it begins with Adam, and it goes through the patriarchs all the way, and they were saved by faith, and saved by faith, and they had faith in God. It didn't say saved by faith, they had faith, right? Anyway, in Hebrews 11, 4, it says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous through this, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. A writer of Hebrew there again is speaking about the blood sacrifice of Jesus after that. Now Cain brought some grain. He brought some grain. Probably not the first kernels to pop out of the ground either, guys. Probably not that first bunch of wheat. He went out there and he had a big old wheat field, probably, and he started cutting some wheat. Now he's bringing this grain. Not the first, like uh, Abel brought. Abel brought that firstborn. He gave of his first and not his excess. He gave of what was first and not his excess. Cain's wheat, he had more of that, but Abel gave of his first. You know, we got to ask ourselves, how are we in that? Do we give God our first, or do we give him our leftovers, you know? 
We have the big turkey dinner. We'll put it to Thanksgiving. We just had Thanksgiving. We got the big turkey up there. And, oh, we carve off all the good turkey. And, and, and we eat that turkey and we get down to the carcass. Well, that's for you, God. You know, that's kind of what I'm saying, right? Do we give him our first or do we give him the leftovers? Many scriptures, guys, speak about giving of our first to God. Giving first. I want you to turn to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. And some of you who know these scriptures here are going, whoa, where are you going, Pastor? But anyway, Malachi, that's just, uh, it's the last Old Testament uh, book in the Old Testament, you know, the last prophet, Malachi, just before Matthew. Giving of our first. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, now I'll warn you. There's those pastors that will read this every time they take a tithe. Every time the baskets pass, they'll read this one here, man. Let's see if we can't get a little more in the till, right? He says there in verse 8, Malachi chapter 4, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, God says. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now, I'm going to come back to that. Tithes and offerings. There's a difference there, church, between a tithe and an offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and there there may be food in my house. And try me in this. God is saying, test me. This is the only place in the Bible where God says, test me here. Test me in this. Only place you'll find this. He says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for, the, open for you the windows of heaven and Pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. And like I say, the one who's trying to get more in that till, in that basket, oh, he'll talk about them blessings. God will give you tenfold back, brother. You know, you know, drop that check in there. That blessings has nothing to do with money, by the way. Count our blessings. Man, how about your health? You know, how about your health? How about we still got a breath of air? You know what I mean? There's so many. How about, man, my child hasn't become some prodigal and went this direction or that direction, you know? There are many blessings to look at. He says, bring in the tithes. Bring in the tithes and offering. See, it's not about the amount. We're going back here, speaking of Cain and Abel. It's not about the amount. It's just the first the first. Now I said why, I said tithes and offerings. Why did I say those were separate? There's a difference, church. There is a difference in tithes and offerings. For instance, and I'll put it this way. Every Sunday, by the way, I don't read that one, do I? <laughs> Every Sunday, we take a tithe. We pass the basket, pass the bag, whatever that is, you know. And you put your tithing in there. That's your tithing unto the Lord goes into the church general fund, and by the way, helps many in the community. And Oh, man, it's helping them, them uh, fire angels, those Christmas angels this year, too. And, and uh, that's a tithe, and that's what you give to the Lord. And some people say, well, 10%. I say give whatever you choose, you know, 10%. You want to give 50%. really don't matter. That's between you and the Lord. But an offering is different now. Now you come up to me and you say, Pastor, I want to help this family over here. I want to help this family. I know they're financially struggling, so I'm going to take my, my tithe. Instead of giving it to the church, I'm going to give it to them. No, no. See, that's different. That's different. The tithe still goes to the church. That's above and beyond. And so you know what? When you give that offering, go above and beyond. It ain't no big deal. God still, here's those blessings. Will I not open up the windows of heaven and give you these blessings, however they come? Now, I rarely teach on tithing. Why? Because it's between you and God, you know. And the only reason I brought this is because of this sacrifice that they were both bringing before him. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You threw three grains of grain on the ground, 
you're going to get very little grain, right? Who pass it out everywhere? There it is. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart or her heart, as you have purpose in your heart. I have nothing to do with that, man. And as far as that goes, whether, whether it's, uh, if you want to go by the 10%, you go by 10%, all right? If you want to go by whatever you want to go by, that's okay. If you want to go less, just purpose in your heart, you know? You want, you want the blessings of God, church. And he says in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. <laughs> if you're sitting there gritting your teeth as you're signing that check, you know, <laughs> that don't work. God says, hey, I'll, I'll burn that one, you know. That's not a, not a good heart. Or of necessity. Well, Pastor Dan said, oh, Pastor Dennis didn't say anything. As you purpose in your own heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, Cain, oh, that's enough of that, all right? Enough of that. But anyway, Cain became angry. He became very angry. Why? He is pride, guys. He had a little brother over here just showed him up for one thing. God respected, uh, you know, uh, Abel's more than his own. He got upset. His pride and his spiritual pride. That sin of mankind was becoming very evident, right, in Cain. That original sin. In verse 6 then, we go on. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? This is interesting, guys. Look at how God deals with Cain. He says, why are, uh, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted, he tells him. And if you do not do well... Well, by the way, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. You remember back here where he's speaking to the woman? He says, your desire shall be for your husband, right? That was the desire was to rule over. Your, and its desire of sin is to rule over you of sin. For you, but you should rule over it, God tells him here. God gives, gives Cain a warning. He gives him a wonderful warning. He wasn't angry at him. He's trying to give him a warning. He says, do well. Don't let this turn to sin, young man. Son, don't let this go that direction, right? Watch out. Sin is at the door, he's telling him. But, but it's, and his desire, by the way, is for you. It's going to capture you if you let it. But you should rule over it. How do we rule over sin, church? I mean, think about it. How do we? For number one, let God master us first. Let God be our master, Jesus our master. You know, without God, we are slaves to sin. Man, years and years I was a slave to sin. Guaranteed, when God came into my life, now God became my master, and he gave me the ability to rule over that sin, to not sin. Am I a sinner still today? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not professing to be some holy of holy by any means. But for the most part, we, get, we come to a point where we can rule over that sin. Just as God told, uh, told Cain there. In verse 8. Now, uh, Cain talked with Abel. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right, well, let's go on up here and have a chit-chat, you know. We're going to go, I'll buy you an iced tea. And Cain talked with Abel, with his, uh, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field now, you know, he's just having a nice little conversation with him, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and just killed him. Boom, just like that, you know. How it took place, they would say a rock, you know, well, they had some way of slaughtering that sheep. Might have been a knife, you know, created from something. I don't know, stone. You know, maybe Abel's walking along and Cain just, you know, got his hand around him. Oh, man, I've had this feeling before, you know. They, they got their arm on you like this. They're your buddy and everything. And then, and then as soon as they get it, they pull out the knife and boom, they stab you in the back. Maybe that's what happened to Abel, you know. Maybe he conked him over the head with a rock, but he killed him right there. This shows in Cain, by the way, premeditated murder. Premeditated. 
In a court of law, it was premeditated murder. He thought it out. He acted upon it. He knew what he was going to do. Cain ignored God completely. He ignored God's way of escape. He said, don't do this, son. Let me, let me tell you, you've got to rule over that sin. And he ignored that way. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, guys, remember this scripture. Scripture here, no temptation is overtaken you except such as common to man. Meaning, you know what? Other people have struggled with it. There's nothing new under the sun. No temptation, no sin has tried to overtake you. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it, he said. He leaves a way of escape. Guaranteed there is always that way whether we take it or not. See, Adam and Eve's original sin, their original sin here, they passed to Cain. That's the, the generation, you know, of sin begotten sin. They passed it to Cain. You know, a simple sin of just going disobedience to God, well, it just increased is all. It magnified itself. And then sin prevailed here. You know, God now confronts Cain here. He's going to confront him over this situation that took place. Repentance needed. There again. There's going to be an opportunity here for repentance. Even after he murdered his brother. By the way, the blood of Christ covers all sins, guys. You understand that? It'll even cover the blood and the sin of a murder. A murder can be saved. And here we're going to see. He's going to have the opportunity Let's see if he takes it. I think we know he doesn't. Uh, let me go here. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, where am I at? Verse 9. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel? Is, where is Abel your brother? He asked him that question. And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, boy, man. The reply of Cain is so famous in this world. Am I my brother's keeper, you know, in the secular world, even in the Christian world? Of, Am I my brother's keeper, <laughs> you know? Yes. By the way, yes, Christian, yes, you are. And, and, and uh, Cain was Abel's keeper. He was his brother's keeper. It wasn't to be his murderer. He was to be his keeper in hell. And, you know, he was his brother. You know, too many times, as I say, those want to shrug off their responsibility as the brother's keeper, as the one to help that brother back up. Well, it's not my problem, you know. Not my problem out there. Not my responsibility. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, you are, darn it. Yes, you are. Are you your sister's keeper? Yes, you are. Being a Christian, to be a keeper, a restorer of others, it's so important. In Galatians 6.1, it'll be on the screen. Brethren, that means male and female, that's the church. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. In a, such a one in a spirit of gentleness, in a spirit of love. you got to restore him. You're your brother's keeper. Consider yourself lest you also be tempted. You're the keeper, you're the restorer of a brother, a sister. You bear them up, man. In Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill what? The law of Christ. You are more Christ-like when you bear that, that burden and you're your brother, you're your sister's keeper. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, I am. And so are you. Verse uh, 10, we got to move on. Oh, my goodness, we got to make it here. Uh, verse 10, we read on. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which, you have, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood and from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Well, you ain't going to grow a crop, boy. You ain't nothing going to grow for you. It's not going to, it's not going to uh, grow anything. And he says, uh, uh, yield to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Wow, man. Our Cain here. The curse that was upon Cain for his sin that was upon him now. Cain would 
would uh, basically reap what he sowed. He's not going to reap anything. He's going to reap what he sowed, though. And what did he sow? He sowed corruption, guys. He murdered his brother. Galatians 6 and 7. Here we go. More in Galatians, right? In Galatians 6 and or, I'm sorry, chapter 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Boy, how many times have you heard your pastor speak this scripture, right? For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption, by the way. But he who sows the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Cain is going to reap exactly this curse. See, Cain's curse here, as he tells him, nothing's going to grow on the earth. You're going to have a hard time with that one. And by the way, you're, you're, you're going to be a vagabond also. Cain's curse was Adam's curse amplified. Amplified, multiplied. Adam had to work for the food, farming very hard. Cain's farming would be impossible. Now, it would be impossible for him. Adam was driven from Eden. Cain would find no place to rest, none at all. He wouldn't have a place. He inherited the sin, and it was amplified. Sin begat sin. The original curse had been amplified, and we're going to see as we continue to study in Genesis, those things do. They amplify that sin, just builds and builds, and it begets the next sin. In verse 13, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment, oh man, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out of this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that that anyone who finds me will kill me. Wah. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now, <laughs> mm, man, what a whiner, dude. You know, you read this here, verse 13, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Right? Oh, man. <coughs> Cain didn't feel bad about his sin at all here. There was no repentance. He didn't feel bad about it. He was only concerned about his punishment. Man, I'm not, uh, my sin? I'm just upset I got caught. All right? I got caught. Woe is me. For many, for many, it's so true. There's no true repentancy. They're just sorry they get caught. Man, I talked to him, and, well, it's that officer's fault, probation officer's fault. Man, what did he do, come to my house and give me a UA there with not even calling me three days in advance, you know? It's their fault, you know? Man, they were just sorry they got caught. That's the whole thing. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, guys. I'm going to turn there. We're running late on time here. Anyway, we're doing okay. We'll make it. A couple minutes here or there. Have some grace, okay? Here we go. Um, 2 Corinthians. Paul has a great thing to say about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Paul tells this Corinth church, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, he says, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Not that you were made sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry now in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Godly, true sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be ever regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. What's the sorrow of the world? I got caught. That's their sorrow right there. Godly sorrow of sin, it leads to repentance. Repentancy changes our ways, right? It changes who we are. It leads us then to salvation, obviously. But worldly sorrow, they, oh, I got caught, changes nothing, guys. It changes absolutely nothing. How do we recognize true repentance? A changed life. You want to see true repentance in somebody? Well, you've seen a changed life. That's what it is. Repentance actually means a change of mind. That word means to change your mind about things. Think differently. Not as the world thinks, not as I used to think, right? But as God thinks and as he instructs through his word. See, Cain had no change at all here. Just upset. Man, he's upset at the punishment. Got caught. 
Cain was worried for his life also. In verse 14 there, going back to Genesis. In verse 14, he says to, to God, he says, Surely you have driven me out of this day. Of the face of the ground, I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive, a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Now he's worried for his life also. They will kill me. And guess what he did? He's blaming God for it. Do you see that? You read that. You've done this to me, God. You put me out here. It's your fault. Wait a minute. What happened to Abel? <laughs> you know, what happened to him? How foolish people can be, church. There's a lot to learn here in this Old Testament, in this, in this history book, basically. How foolish people can be. Blame God for their sin. What did I say earlier? You got to own it. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he self, himself tempt anyone. Oh, but they want to blame, they want to blame God, right? In verse 15, God, why did you let that temptation come in front of me? I didn't, it just happened. God gives you the way of escape, though, that's for sure. Verse 15, and the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord, the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. God's anger was great against Cain. But see, God did not want to kill Cain. Now, many places in the Old Testament, when you defy God in that way, even in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, boom, you die. You lied to us, right? But he didn't want to kill him. Why? Well, the only reason I can come up with, guys, is uh, we now have a population in the earth of three. Cain, I think I need you. I'm going to use you a little bit, all right? You're going to help populate a little bit, too, all right? That's all I can think. Why else? God set a mark on Cain. What was this mark? What was the mark? Guys, we'll never know. Some people, well, you know, they want to say, well, it was this, it was that. We do not know. It's God mark of protection upon Cain. Guys, we as believers also have a mark. The Bible tells us we have been sealed with a mark of the Holy Spirit upon us. As you believe in Christ, you've been sealed. Ephesians 1.13. In him you, who you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed, you were now sealed, boom, with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ain't nobody taken away. Well, can somebody kill you? Yeah. They can, but guess what? They can't kill you. <laughs> You're going to heaven. What's the worst you can do to me? Send me to heaven, I guess. So we look at the sin of Adam and how quickly it progressed. One little bite of the fruit, right? One simple sin of disobedience, amplified all the way to murder at this point. Guys, sin is a cancer. It really is. A cancer as we know it, right? Left alone, it destroys everything in its path. But when you cut it out, and they do that with cancer, right? Just had our, our brother Earl have some cancer cut out, you know, a big section of it. But anyway, they cut it out. Well, then life is restored. Life can be renewed. And you can have that life in Jesus. It only stands to reason, you know. Only think about it. Sin destroys. And it only stands to reason. And we should be reasonable about it. I love this in Isaiah. We're going to end with this verse. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. God says, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Come, child. Come sit down here. I'll sit down by you. Let's, let's just reason out a little bit here. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, he says. I'm going to wash you clean. I'm going to wash you clean. In verse 19. If you are willing, though, and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you are willing and obedient. Well, that's pretty simple. Really, it is. In verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, like Cain, you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Sin begat sin. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word, Lord. <sighs> God, there is so much in here. <laughs> Jesus, just thank you that you, uh, you teach us in all areas of your word. Father, that uh, Lord, help us to overcome. Give us the strength. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.